get some ushers. Well, you may be saved.
God good? Amen. And you can take a little reverb out of night too if you want. Amen. Don't you love the Lord? Amen. How many of you have had a wonderful week so far? God's good, right? How many of you are tired tonight? But God's still good, right? Amen. It's been a week, but I want you to know something. God is faithful and He is good through everything. Don't you love Him? Amen. We're going to be talking about the book of 1 Thessalonians tonight. And um, we're going to, if you'll turn to chapter 1 and verse number 5 and stand for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. We do want to take a moment to welcome our visitors. If you're visiting tonight, um, we are just so thankful that, that you're here, that you're worshiping with us. Uh, we invite you, if you don't have a church home, to come grow with us. Let's grow together at the Pam Church of God. We're so thankful that you're here. Um, chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians, verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but, in all, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. I want to focus on for our gospel. God, this is Paul speaking about the gospel he was preaching. Came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. Can we pray together and ask God to bless our night? Father, we love you. We ask in the name of Jesus for the anointing that makes preaching change lives. Hide me behind the cross. Somehow take my words, Lord, and let them go forth with power. Lord, dip them in your anointing. Lord, anoint every heart, mind, soul, spirit, and ear to receive. And Lord, help us leave here today encouraged, changed, lifted up. Lord, I pray that you'll help us go another mile for you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God the Lord. What a great time we had Sunday. God is doing some incredible things. Sunday morning we talked about the, um, uh, the mountain and the mustard and how God has a desire to move mountains in our life, but he does it through mustard seed faith. And there's some things required for us to have that type of faith. Mustard seed faith is a faith that is uh, we focus on the size of the faith, but God focuses on the life in the faith. Mustard is full of life. That mustard seed was full of life. And Sunday night, we talked about value, that God sees value in us, even when we don't see value in ourselves. So much, he said, we were worth dying for, and he proved it at Calvary. Amen? So we're looking for good things tonight. We are talking about the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going through the books of the New Testament. Last year we went through the books of the Old Testament. And um, what a great time we had going through the books of the Old Testament. It is my conviction. I'm convicted today more than ever, Sister Karen, that we need a revival. Obviously, we need a revival of the Spirit. We know that. Amen. And we need a revival of faith. We, but we need a revival of the Word of God in our lives, Brother Amen. Paul. Because listen to me. It is the Word of God that possesses the power of God unto salvation. We need a revival in the Word. So we've been talking about the books of the New Testament. We've been given kind of a, a, a rough synopsis, if you would, to help us and empower us to study the Word for ourselves. Two weeks ago, Pastor Wayne Parker did an outstanding job talking about the book of Colossians and God used him in a great way. Tonight we're talking about 1 Thessalonians. So uh, some things I want you to know about the book of, of 1 Thessalonians is, is uh, actually it was the first letter Paul wrote. Some people don't realize that. If you were looking in order, it was the first letter Paul wrote. Most theologians believe um, it, it's a book that if you look at it, chronological order it was written before any of the other ones. It was, it's not an order in your Bible, but it was one of his very, very early books that he wrote. Now, the, the church at Thessalonica, some cool things about Thessalonica is it was a city that was actually named after the half-sister of Alexander the Great. I didn't know that until the day. That was pretty neat. Um, just some, some notes for us to have. Now, the, this was a strong church. 
The church of Thessaloniki was solid. They were strong. They were growing. They were growing by leaps and bounds. And, and we, they were seeing great things happen, miracles happen. But this was a church that, that Paul really, he planted this church in about a month. He spent four to six weeks in Thessalonica working so diligently by the grace of God to plant a church. He spent about 18 months uh, at Corinth planting that church. And when he left, they still had a mess. And right, Pastor Wayne, they still had a mess in Corinth. But he spent about a month in Thessalonica, and they were solid. They were solid. He was able to speak to them about the meat of the word. They were a strong, thriving church. They didn't have all the moral issues, per se, that maybe the church of Corinth had or some of the other churches. They were solid people that just loved God and wanted to do his will. So this is a church that was planted in about a month of time. They were growing. They were thriving. It was a solid church. Now, now, but how many of you know, regardless of how solid a church is or how solid we are, look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. If you have ever told the truth, you just told it today. Now, husbands, you did have the right to plead the Fifth Amendment. Just say it. You're not perfect and neither am I. The good news is, is that we are, we do not have to be perfect to be who God wants us to be. We just have to have his grace. There's no perfect person. So guess what? What does this church consist of? People, right? So guess what? There is no perfect church. So there are no perfect people and there are, there is no perfect church. So um, while I would like to think that, that you know this is one of the best churches in the entire world, guess what? I know we're not perfect because I'm here. And I'm not perfect. And if you'll be honest, neither are you. So this is not a perfect church. So there was room for improvement. There was room for growth. And Paul is trying to help them in this as he writes them a letter. Now the church of Thessalonica was a church made up of Gentiles. Not many Jews were in this church. This was mostly a Gentile church, meaning that, that they were not a lot of religious folk in this church. Um, so what that would mean for this church is uh, many of the religious folks um, were very close-minded to, to the things of the New Testament. Um, kind of like whenever you see someone today and, and they grew up in church. And they grew up seeing things, and, and maybe they grew up, and you're not going to like this, but this is the truth. But they grow, grew up, maybe they were hurt in church. Now listen, growing up in church is a wonderful thing. But, but maybe they were hurt in church, and all of a sudden they're not open to what God wants to say. That, that, that wasn't the case with the Gentiles. That because if it, was a, if it were a Jewish church, the Jews would have been closed-minded wanting to live in the days of Moses, but not this church. This was a church open to the grace of God. Uh, this was a city named after the half-sister of Alexander the Great. This was also a capital city of one of the Roman districts. This was a city that had great, that was a great trading hub between Asia and Europe. They had a lot of money. This was a wealthy area. This was a great city. It was a beautiful city. They had a huge uh, amphitheater where they would have shows of entertainment. And people would come from all over to see uh, gladiator events and public games that would be in the city. So it was a place that had a lot of foot traffic coming through. A great opportunity to do ministry. An opportunity to work for God. Do you know that? Today, every day, we have opportunities to do something for God. Every time you come in contact with someone, it's another opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. It's another opportunity. If God doesn't, doesn't prompt you to share the gospel, you can show the love of God in your character and the way you act. You can testify of God's goodness in the way you carry yourself, the way we carry ourselves. So they had all of these opportunities. It was a growing church. Good things were happen, happening. And, and Paul is writing to this church, and he applauds the church. He applauds the church. In chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and Jennifer, I'm sorry, I know I forgot to give you this scripture. I just saw it. So chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, we see that Paul really thought a lot about the church at Thessalonica. Um, we'll give her just a second to get that pulled up. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, 
He says this, Paul and uh, Silvanus and Timothy, or Timothy uh, to the church of, of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The next verse, he begins to talk about how much he loves them. We give thanks to God always for you, all making mention of you in our prayers. So Paul was not grieved when he thought about the church at Thessalonica. He was excited. He gave thanks to God for the, for the solid doctrine, for the beliefs of of this church. Uh, do you know that this was a church that actually, and we'll talk about it as we go through the night, this was a church that really, they, they come to Christ quickly. They and, and many people, when they when Jesus talked about the seed that takes root in stony soil, you remember that parable about Jesus sowing seed and some fell by the wayside and others fell among the thorns, some fell among the stones, and the ones among the, 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 the stones they took and the real quick roots and they grew quickly, but when the sun come up, they began to dry because they did not have what? Roots. This was a church that rooted quickly, and they were very strong. They had a made-up mind for Jesus Christ. Do you know today there is still a power that's found in a made-up mind for God? There's power in a made-up mind. Chapter 1, verse 5, we read it earlier. He talks about we come to you not just now. He's just he's exhorting them right now. He says, we come to you and we share the word of God, but it was not word only, but it was in the power of the Holy Ghost. He's talking to them about how they were, in, in verses 1 and 2, he's talking about how he gives thanks for their faith, their solid faith, but now he's talking about they came in, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. So we've got a church here that is that has faith and they have word and they have power and the Holy Ghost. Listen, we have a lot of folks today, there are a lot of people in in what we call the church world. And you've got your faith preachers that preach this over here. And you've got your, your kingdom preachers that preach this over here. And you've got your, your, your classical Pentecostals that preach this over here. But I want you to know that God wants us to be rooted in the word and in the power of God and in the Holy Ghost. And he wants us to take this entire book and live it. We need a revival of the word of God along with the power of God. How many of you know that the Bible says a letter killed the what? The Spirit. We need the Word and the Spirit. And who says this church had this? Not only did they receive the Word, but they received it with power and they received it with the Holy Ghost. It sounds like a great church, right? So, so in chapter 1, verse 6, listen. In, in chapter 1, verse 6, I came to you. Praise Jesus. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the Word in much affliction. With joy of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, so this is a church that, that not only had great faith, not only did the power of God operate in their life, they had the Holy Ghost working, but they were a church that had their struggles and their issues and their afflictions. They had their struggles. They had their difficult times. But I want you to know there was a power that come and said what? Even in affliction, with much, in much affliction, they received it with the joy of the Holy Ghost. So he's talking about this is a great church. And if I could give this book a title, I would call this the Hope Book. This book is filled with hope. So he's talking to the church all through chapter 1. And he's just, he's exhorting them. He's edifying them. He's, he's thanking God for their faith, for how they receive power and the Holy Ghost. And even in afflictions, they've still got the joy of God in their life. Do you know that even in the storms of life, we can still have joy? Amen. That's right. Even whenever the bill's due and you don't know where it's coming from, you can still have joy. Even when your family's going crazy and your job is, is, is questionable, we can still have joy. He said you still have joy in the Holy Ghost. And but this is about book of hope. So in, in chapter 1, he's talking to them basically. 
he, he's talking to them about this 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 incredible encouraging hope. He's inspired by the hope that, that they've received the gospel with such joy. And they've taken such root. In chapter 2, he talks more about an encouraging hope. <laughs> chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, this is what the Bible says. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of God. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Now listen to the next verse. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. I want to stop there a second. God is with us. See, that's the first time. So he's speaking to them, and he says, you know what? I didn't have to be seeker friendly for you to receive the gospel. That's right. Let me read it again. Go back to verse 3. I want you to get this. This is what he, for our exhortation, our preaching, our lifting up, was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor of God. But as we were allowed of God, so God allowed them to be put in trust with the gospel. The gospel. The power of the gospel. God allowed us to bring them the gospel. To bring you the gospel. Even so we speak not as pleasing men. But God which trieth our hearts. Next verse. For neither at any time use we flattering words. We didn't have to do that. We just brought the word and we brought it straight. And you received it. And ye know nor a cloak of covetousness. God is our witness. Chapter 2, verse 13. I think I gave that one to you. Chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively Work of also in you that believe. I didn't have to pull any rabbits out of my hat. I didn't have to do any tricks. We just brought the word of God. And the word of God is the power of salvation. Of God into salvation has changed and transformed your life. He says we were able to just, we were able to shoot straight with you. Nowadays we have, I don't want to get negative. Come on. But, but we live in a day that we, we think we have to be so seeker friendly that if we're not careful, we'll water down the gospel. And listen, I'm all for loving on people. You know that about me, I hope. And, and you're about loving people and loving God, and I thank God for that. But listen, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. God forbid that we ever water down the gospel. God forbid that we water down the gospel. He said, I didn't have to do that with you. You're a great church. You're solid. In chapter 2, verses 19 through 20, he talks about how he's encouraged in his faith. For what is our hope? There's that word, hope. What is our hope? Our joy, our crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. Verse 20. For ye are our glory and joy. He's talking still about this church. He's building them up. He's talking about how much joy they brought in receiving the gospel of him. So Paul, up until this point, is just raving about the church at Thessalonica. But there was one issue. Remember, I said no church was perfect. There was, there was an issue that they had in Thessalonica. And there was some confusion among doctrine. They were a great church. They did not have a problem loving Jesus. They did not have a problem receiving the gospel straightforward. They did not have a problem with moral issues. That was not the problem at Thessalonica. Thessalonica, they were two different sets of people. And they had a struggle with among themselves on the resurrection of the dead. And on the second coming of Jesus Christ. They loved God. They did all kinds of types of good works. They did great things. But yet they struggled in the area of the second coming of the Lord. And they struggled with the resurrection of the dead. You have one set of people that believed that, the, that there was no resurrection. You had a group of people, individuals in the church of Thessalonica that believed that if you died in Christ, 
that there was no resurrection from the dead. And you would not be a part of the second coming of Christ. Um, and then you had another group that said, you're wrong. He is coming back. But they were so far, listen, on the other end of the spectrum. Anybody have a piece of paper? Piece of paper. I, I'll use this. <laughs> they literally had this mentality. I've got my ticket in hand. I'm going to sit at the station and wait for the good old gospel ship. They were of the thought that he was coming so there was no need to do anything else. We have to be careful of that. What, did, what does the word teach us to? Occupy till he comes. I believe he may come back tomorrow. But you know what? When he comes back, I want him to find me working and doing yes. something for him. Telling somebody about Jesus. Amen. And so you had these two groups. One says... One group says, there is no resurrection of the dead. The other group says, oh, yes, there is. He's coming, and we're not doing anything until he gets here. <laughs> Church folk are so funny. We're so funny. We mean well, and God loves us in spite of us. Aren't you thankful that God, that Jesus loves us in spite of ourselves? But that's the two groups you have in church, Pastor Wayne. You have these two groups. One says, he's not even coming back. The other says he is coming back and we're not doing nothing until he gets here. So Paul begins to address in chapters 3 through 5, he begins to talk about the hope of the return of Jesus. Listen, I want to share something with you. Do you know from the book of Matthew to the book of Revelation, 318 times within the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there's a reference to the Lord's return. There's a reference to the Lord's return. That would be, if you average it out between verses, that would be one in 20 verses would have a reference referring to the Lord's return. I would say it's pretty important to you. There's a reason we sing about his coming. We encourage ourselves with these things. Paul begins to put a focus on the Lord's return. In chapter 3, in the first five verses of chapter 3, he talks a lot about, he begins to talk about the tribulations and difficulties that they have faced. Not only he himself, but they as a church have faced difficulties. And in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, I hope I gave that to you, he begins to talk about the importance of standing. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in our affliction and distress by your faith. There he is. He's talking again about how they encouraged him. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Listen to me, church. Today it is just as important as it was 100 years ago. It was just as important as it was 500 years ago that we stand fast fast and firm in the truth of the word of God. And he's talking to them about the importance of standing firm. Then in chapter 3 verse 13 um, chapter 3 and 13 to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father. At the what? Coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now he's really upsetting the group that says there is no resurrection. He's got them upset now. The other group is over here shouting, saying, yeah, we told you he was coming. We got our ticket. Hope you got yours. <laughs> but this group over here, they're getting upset at this point. He's talking about um, uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to what he says in verse 13, if you'll leave it up there. To the end, may he establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. That is a power-packed verse. There are three things he mentions. He talks about being established. He talks about holiness. And he talks about the Lord's return. Three things key things that are so vital for us to live a life of victory until he comes. He says be established in your hearts. We need to be established in the word of God, in the things of God, in our faith. We need to be established in our faith. He, then he says well, 
unblameable in what? That word we don't hear very much anymore. The word holiness. Listen, I know that it's not popular and I know we don't preach it very much anymore. But the word of God still says without holiness, no man shall see God is still in the book. They never took it out. It's still there. Holiness is still God's standard of living. Now listen to me. Don't get wrapped up in the trap that we can work our way to knowing God. God forbid. The only path to holiness is through the cross. The only path to holiness is up a hill called Calvary. That's the only path to holiness is through Jesus Christ. So three key points for us to live victoriously, and he gives it in that one verse. Establish your faith, walk in holiness, but then look for his return. Look for his return. Look for his coming. You know the early church looked for him to come every single day. They believed he would come today. We've gotten away from thinking that way. He can still come today. It may be 10 years. It may be 10,000 years. But until then, my heart will go on singing. I'm looking for him. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. He begins to talk. So he's talking to them about establishing your faith, walking in holiness, and looking for his return. Now, in chapter 4, verse 1, he's going to talk about, furthermore, we then beseech you, brother, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus Christ, as ye have received of us how we ought to walk and please God. Now, now, let me stop a second. What did he just say in verse 13? He talked about looking for his return. He says, now this is how you need to live to look for his return. You need to walk and to please God. It's hard to go wrong if we live every day to please God. Listen, we'll all fail and come short of his glory. But if we'll seek to please God, we'll find ourselves on the right road. So you would abound more and more. So he's talking now about what you need to do to look for his return. Walk to please God. Verse 9. Verse 9. This is a tough one. But as touching brotherly love. Remember what did he say in verse 13? He said, look for what? His. You know, let's get that. Look for his. His return. <laughs> in verse 13, he said, look for his return. Chapter 3, verse 13, look for his return. What did he say look for? His return. his return. If we're going to look for his return, how do we need to walk? Yeah, yeah, but I just read it in verse 1. Go to chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Walk to please God. If we're looking for his return, we need to walk to what? Please God. If we're going to walk to please God, now go to verse 9. Uh-oh, but that's touching brotherly love. <laughs> we got to love one another. Pastor, you just lost me. I was all good with holiness. I was all good with living right, with following Jesus, with carrying my cross, with, with everything you just said. But now you're saying, I got to love my brother. I don't even like my brother. <laughs> I don't even like him, and you want me to love him? But, but as touching brotherly love, he need not that I write to you, but ye you yourselves are taught of God. I don't have to tell you about this because God doesn't say it. Jesus said it. You ought to love one another. You ought to love one another. So if we're looking for his return, we need to seek to please God. We need to love one another. I love verse 11. I love verse 11. And that ye study to be quiet. <laughs> let the church say amen. amen. Listen, let me tell you something. Let me do about two and a half minutes of marriage counseling. Husbands, read that verse. <laughs> Read that verse. Study to be quiet. But let's, let's keep going a little further. Well, now remember, why are we do why are we read chapter 4? Because we're looking for what? His return. 
So because we're looking for his return, we're living a life to please God, we're loving our brothers, and we're going to study to be quiet. <laughs> and I love the next phrase. And do to your own business. Why don't you mind your own business? It's in the Bible. You know, Jesus said the same thing. Peter was, uh, uh, you, have, you have John who's a beloved disciple. And, 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 and Peter, Jesus just told Peter, said, hey, you're going to die a death that you don't desire to die. And Peter said, well, what's going to happen to him? Jesus said, mind your own business. <laughs> Read your Bible. He said, what is it to you? What happens to him? You go feed my sheep and mind your own business. Carry your own cross. <laughs> so we're looking for his return. Because he is coming, right? If we're going to do that, we're going to live a life to please God. We're going to love our brothers. And we're going to mind our own business. <laughs> yeah, you better study to be quiet. <laughs> mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we command. That reminds me of something. Jesus was talking about someone who talking about the moat in their brother's eye. They had a beam in their own eye. Remember that? Study to be quiet. Seek your own business. Deal with your own self. And to work with your own hands. Your own hands. God's got something for you to do. Something for I to do. Something for me to do. You and I. He's got something for us to do and we need to seek to do it. As we commanded you. Verse 12, that we may what? Walk honestly toward them that are without, that ye may have lack of nothing. So he's coming back, and we're going to look for his return. And when we're looking for his return, we're going to walk to please God. We're going to love each other, study to be quiet, mind our own business, and walk honestly. Sounds like we're on the right path. You see, and then he goes on in the next verse to talk about this incredible hope we have. And he settles the whole debate about is there a resurrection and what happens to those that are dead in Christ. He settles it all. He drops the mic in the next few verses. Go to verse 13 for me if you would. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. If you don't have it, get it in Jesus' name. <laughs> Chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. She's going to get it. Got to help her. He's already helping her because she has to work with me. It's coming. It's coming. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But I would not have you ignorant, brother. And he's talking to both sides. I would not have you ignorant, brother, concerning them that are asleep, that ye sorrow not. Don't be sad. Even as others which have no hope. Remember, this is the hope book. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Christ will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. This is God speaking by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He's saying, you know what? They might have already died, but nothing to do with us living is going to keep them from raising again. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then, and then, go to the... Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can we give God some praise and thank him that he's coming back? Where are we? Comfort one another with these words. Why do we sing, I'll fly away? Because Jesus said in verse Why do we sing the prayer bells of heaven? Because it says comfort 
one another with these words. Why do we sing hymns and spiritual songs, Pastor Wayne? Because the Word of God said we're to comfort one another with these words. He is coming back. And you know what? When I'm having a bad day, I can be encouraged that after a while, Sister Clara, it'll all be over because He is coming back to get us. If our only hope lies in this world, we are of men most miserable. So he says, comfort yourself with these words. Sing about it, talk about it, shout about it, rejoice about it. Because he is coming back. And I want you to know that the dead's going to rise, and we're going to rise, and we will meet him together in the air. And then in chapter 5, verse 1, he says, this is how he's going to come. But of the times and seasons, brother, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. In other words, you don't know. As a matter of fact, it'll be an hour when you think not. When they say peace and safety, sure. have you thought about how quick a twinkle of an eye is? I don't even know if we can blink fast enough to represent a twinkle of an eye. But according to my Bible and yours, that's how fast he's coming back to get his church. We don't talk about the rapture enough anymore. Because this may be too controversial in today's church because there's so many folks that don't even believe in it anymore. I want you to know, he said, comfort one another with these words. And when you live in an hour when you think not, as a thief in the night. So knowing we have hope, knowing he's coming, I love how he closes this book. So let's do a synopsis. First two chapters, he raves about their faith. He, Paul raves about how strong they are in, in, in Christ and the word. Then in chapter 3, he begins to address their issues. They're struggling with some doctrinal issues about the resurrection of the dead, about the coming back of the Lord. And he begins to talk to them about living, establishing your faith, walking in holiness, and looking for his return because he's coming. Then he goes on to say, as we're looking for his return, what do we need to do? Walk to please God, love each other, study to be quiet and mind your business, and walk Honestly, because why? You have hope because the angel himself will descend with the trumpet and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those that are alive and remain shall be called up to meet him in the air. And when it happens, it's going to be an hour when you think not, when you least expect it. So let me close this book out like this. In chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, he says, this is how we're going to close the book. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us which let us watch and be sober. Let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that are drunken are drunken in the night. Next verse. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He said he's coming in an hour when you think not, so we don't have time to sleep in our faith. We don't have time to sleep. They that sleep, sleep in the night. They that are drunken are drunken in the night. We've got to watch and be sober. He exhorts them on how to be ready. In chapter 5, verses 14 through 23, I give you that. Now, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. We are charged by God to preach this gospel to them that are without faith. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble, feeble minded. Support the weak. And the next verse is so powerful. Be patient toward all men. Boy, that's a statement there. Be patient toward all men. Next verse. 
See that none render evil for evil. We preach about that a whole lot. We love them that hate us. We bless them that curse us. Render not evil for evil unto any man, but uh, but uh, ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Next verse. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. In verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word again. He's coming. What are we doing? We're watching. How are we watching? We're walking to please God. We're loving one another. We're studying to be quiet. We're minding our own business. And we're walking honestly. Preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he gives them a closing of hope. You are not people without hope. Jesus is coming back. But he also gives a warning. Be ready for that return. Stand all over this house if you will. The book of 1 Thessalonians in a nutshell. Is a book written to some good people that love God. But they had some doctrinal error. About the coming of the Lord. And Paul applauded them. He didn't give some kind of terrible rebuke. He just says listen. I want you to be ready because he is coming. He is coming. You're not without hope. But be ready for his return. Aren't you thankful for the word of God? I'm thankful for his word. No one's looking around just a moment.
give a warning to be ready. He is coming back. I love you. God bless you as our prayer. Don't miss the things going on at the church. I am so excited about what God's doing. We have a ladies meeting tomorrow night at 7. Um, bring a covered dish with food in it. If you're a lady, if you're a guy, don't come. And um, uh, what else? Uh, the youth group is leaving to go to Winterfest very early Friday morning. So um, be prepared for that. And I'll be praying for them. And listen, come Sunday. And bring someone with you. God's doing good things. He has saved, I think, seven people around our altars so far this year. And uh, I'm so thankful and excited about what he's doing. Now, Sunday morning, we will be um, we will be baptizing some. If you're interested in being baptized, um, be sure to let me know. And uh, we, we've got some that are being baptized this Sunday. So let me know if you want to be a part of that. I love you. God bless you is our prayer. Sunday night, we have the Anchorman Quartet will be here. Um, they do a great job. They're a Southern Gospel Music um, group, and they'll come. And uh, they were in the area and asked for a place to sing. And uh, so we accommodated, and we're looking forward to having a good time in the Lord. Uh, we are working on the things we voted on the other day, um, on increasing our seating. The architect is working on it as we speak, and uh, we'll be getting back with you very soon on, on those improvements. And, and making some decisions. God bless you as our prayer. We love you. Stand if you would. And um, let's be dismissed.